It's just such a pleasure to be here and thank the organizers especially for the opportunity. Uh, so we've heard such a variety of interesting talks and it really inspired me to try something uh, which may be considered bait and switch because rather than talk exactly on what I said I was going to talk about, I'd like to look at, that's odd, let's, let's go back, uh, rather than geochemical complexities as a setting for life's origin, I would like to look at a more philosophical aspect of this and look at this question about whether life's origin, in fact, was a deterministic aspect of the cosmic imperative or perhaps it's more of a chance event. And what I want to show is three things. First, I want to propose a framing of life's origin that I think we're all familiar with, the idea that this is a sequence of chemical reactions, but just remind you of what that might imply. Second, I want to demonstrate that this idea of chance versus necessity, at least in terms of the probabilities of chemical reactions, is a false dichotomy. And finally, something that we don't talk about often enough, that things that may be very, very difficult to reproduce in laboratory timescales may nevertheless be deterministic at the scale of planets. And just do a very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation to begin a dialogue on this. A lot of this material is very new. It's just being developed by my group. I think we're kind of at sea a little bit. And what I'm really hoping for is for lots of feedback from you to help us develop these ideas in a more rigorous way. Okay, so let's just look at a few of the basic ideas. I want to begin by proposing this framing of life's origin as a sequence of chemical reactions. And I think that that's fairly straightforward. There's some assumptions we all make that the first life forms were carbon-based, that the origin of life was a chemical process, that we, we just be, rely on the basic raw materials of an early Earth, that's the oceans, the atmosphere, rocks and minerals, um, the exogenous entry of, of additional organic molecules and so forth, and that you can think of this process as a sequence of chemical reactions. And just to get us all on the same page, I want to remind you that these chemical reactions that life uses are the very basic ones that we see every day, things like oxidation reduction reactions, things that we see in cooking uh, using antacids. And if you remind you, the oxidation reduction reactions are the transfer of electrons. In cooking, we see polymerization and depolymerization reactions. We also see hydration, dehydration reactions, and of course, acid-base reactions. These are the kinds of things that would have occurred on early Earth and are all steps that are important. Another key point, and it was to have been the main point of my talk, but I think we've seen enough other uh, presentations that emphasize this, that there are geochemical complexities. You cannot understand the transition from geochemistry to biochemistry without recognizing that early Earth environments are extremely complex and dynamic. So they have gradients in temperature and chemistry. They have cycles, day, night, hot, cold, wet, dry, many other cycles that drive selection in various chemical systems. There's so many fluxes that are important. We have many interfaces on which inter interesting chemistry can occur. And just the sheer chemical complexity of the geochemical environment. Let me remind you that in a typical ocean environment, you can measure 50 or 60 chemical species, major, minor, and trace elements. And as we well know, even trace element concentrations of some transition metals can completely change the chemical behavior of a system. So we need to remember these ideas about early Earth as a system. So I will argue that life began as a sequence of chemical reactions. There are chemical reactions that make biomolecules. Then there are reactions that select, organize, perhaps self-organize some of those molecules. Finally, the evolution of a self-replicating cycle of chemical reactions. And very, very quickly, we've seen many of these discussions. There'll be more of them in the next couple of days but we've seen chemical reactions that occur in air through the interaction of various ionizing kinds of events. We've seen chemical reactions that occur in deep space. Beautiful talk this morning about that. We've seen chemical reactions that can occur in volcanic vents uh, at or near those vents in a submarine setting. Any place where you have carbon, small molecules, and an energy source, it seems like we make these molecules. I think that's a fairly well established. Lots of details still need to be worked out, but that's one set of chemical reactions. Then you need to take those chemicals, and in fact, you produce so many different kinds of small organic molecules that one of the problems then is selection and concentration. 
self-organization of those molecules. And we see many different processes that can do these. The two main ones, I think, are molecular self-assembly, self-organization. Um, Pierre Monard is here. There's many people who have worked on this, and it's a fascinating aspect. Must have been part of the story. And then, of course, you can self-assemble into vesicles and, and other organized principles. I've been working on mineral surfaces. We see, for example, when you look at quartz crystals that have been coated by, in this case, iron oxide, you get differential absorption on different faces, and so we've been studying the same kind of phenomenon with molecules on mineral surfaces. You can, for example, get chiral selection on mineral surfaces, even though calcite itself is not a chiral mineral, the surfaces are chiral. And so understanding how in various geochemical environments minerals can select and concentrate different molecules is an important part of our research program right now. But I'm not going to talk about that just in principle. We understand that you can do both prebiotic self-assembly and we can also do absorption on mineral surfaces or presumably on other kinds of environments in a geochemical environment. And then finally, this idea of creating a chemical reaction cycle or network. So we have people like Harold Morowitz who have long advocated that the re reductive TCA cycle is one possible example of this cycle, a series of reactions that's self-replicating. Stuart Kaufman's idea of an autocatalytic network, which I think still is fascinating, although virtually impossible to test in a laboratory. Ideas of the RNA world, we'll hear more about that later from Antonio. And so these are all ideas that are out there. I think then one can at least frame the origin of life as a sequence of chemical reactions. Okay. So having said that, at some point you have the self-replicating system of molecules. I think the idea that we all accept now is because small organic molecules are subject to what you might call mutations of various kinds just by simple substitutions. You can then have competition, selection, and this is for many of us the idea of a self-replicating cycle that can evolve. This is the beginning of something that looks much more like a Darwinian process and therefore origin of life. So that's part one, the conclusion, just framing the origin of life in terms of a sequence of chemical reactions. And an important point, there may be many different sequences, many different ways to get to an endpoint that's self-replicating. We simply don't know that. We know that there was at least one. So now I want to look at this question of chance versus necessity. It's one that has been long discussed in origin of life and perhaps polarized to an extent that's not appropriate. Um, you certainly know of Jacques Monod's comment that life emerged only by chance. Uh, this is a bit of a polarization of his ideas, which were more nuanced, but nevertheless, people associate Jacques Monod with the idea that life is rare or unique in the cosmos. It was immediately challenged by others, the 1970 book, uh, 76 book, Anti-Chance, where the origin of life and evolution were necessary. Okay, so we have these two extremes, chance versus necessity. What I would like to do is propose an argument based on chemical reactions that in fact this is a false dichotomy and we need a much more subtle and nuanced view of this idea. And here's the idea. The Earth's chemical reactions display a wide range of probabilities. But of course, how do you determine probabilities of chemical reactions? And I would have said a year ago that was impossible. But I've been doing research on minerals and their distribution and diversity and it turns out we've discovered a statistical method to show the probability of more than 5,000 chemical reactions on Earth and whether they would occur. These are the chemical reactions that produce the more than 5,000 known mineral species. This involves studying very large databases that list all of those minerals and list hundreds of thousands of localities. And what we find is if you look at those localities, you find a distribution, a frequency distribution of minerals across Earth's surface. This graph on the horizontal scale is the, shows the number of minerals localities that have been reported in a very large uh, open access crowdsourced database of mineral localities. And what we find is some minerals are found at tens of thousands of localities, others at a few thousand, others at a few hundred. But on the vertical scale, the probability of finding a mineral at a specific number of localities, it is much more likely that you'll find a mineral at only very few localities. Six, eight percent of all minerals are found at exactly three localities. Twelve percent are found at exactly two localities. 
fully 22% of those 5,000 mineral species are known from only a single locality on Earth. So this gives us a distribution function for minerals, which is quite analogous to the distribution of biomass in a forest ecosystem. So almost all the biomass is in redwood trees, almost all the diversity in small rare species, and one can predict a number of mineral missing species by going into a forest and looking at the first plant, the second plant, the third plant, the thousandth, the ten thousandth plant. Each time you count those, is it a new species or not, and you get what are known, well known in the field, as accumulation curves. These can be done with individual species, they can be done with genomes, and you can predict after counting more and more individuals through the asymptotic relationship, how many are yet to be discovered. Turns out we can do the same thing with minerals. Surprisingly, the statistics we use are not that for biomass, but rather for words in a book, lexical statistics, which have been extremely well refined because of, the, in North America, the, um, the terrorist concerns of the National Security Administration, the NSA. They have developed to a high degree of resolution lexical statistics so they can look at emails and determine the authorship. And what you do is you find that a few words are extremely common, a, and, and the, but most of the words are rare, used only once or twice. And it's those distinctive words and phrases that tell you the authorship, the genre, this sort of thing. And there's a whole mathematics devoted to this. It's called large number of rare event statistics. Turns out that the mineral kingdom fits exactly these statistical models. What it means is that you have a few minerals that are extremely abundant, but most minerals are rare, and you can therefore develop a distribution function that looks like this. In black is the actual mineral counts, minerals from exactly one locality, two, three, four, et cetera. In red is this one particular LNRE model, large number of rare events model. This allows us to do a number of things. We can do, predict both the missing minerals on Earth and the probabilities for each of those minerals. So let me go through this. This is our accumulation curve, just like you saw for biology, that the total number of mineral counts. This means a mineral count is a locality and a species. So quartz in Vilnius would be one particular count we have now about 650,000 of these counts on the vertical scale, the number of known mineral species. When you first start going out into the field and hammering on rocks, you find new species rapidly. The more rocks and minerals you look at, the fewer new species. This is at the point when we did our first analysis. We were at 4,831 mineral species from about 650,000 localities. We can predict, therefore, extrapolating into the future to a total number of mineral species on Earth, about 1,500 of which exist on Earth but have yet to be described and characterized. So we can now predict what those are. We're going out and we've actually found some of them just by these statistical methods. But more relevant to this talk is the probability distribution of those 6,000 minerals. So here, on the vertical scale, is the probability of finding that mineral. On the horizontal scale, the rank from the commonest mineral to what we presume is the rarest one down here. And this is the point. We're not talking strictly about determinism, although there are almost 3,000 minerals that are extremely likey, likely. There's some that are intermediate, and there's some that are quite rare. And so I would say when you look at the distribution of these chemical reactions, these 6,400 some chemical reactions, we have some that are a necessity. They're going to occur on any planet. If you replay Earth, you will see those same minerals for sure. We have some that are frozen accidents, less than a 10% probability of seeing those particular minerals. So those chemical reactions are somewhat rare. And many, many things that are just intermediate probabilities. It's a range from nearly 100% to much less than 10%. So my argument here is that each species represents a chemical reaction, some of which are more likely than others. Now, I know it's a stretch to say that the chemical reactions that form those 5,000 some minerals are analogous to the chemical reactions that form organic molecules that may have been important steps in the origin of life. Nevertheless, this does make the point that when you have large number of possible chemical reactions, some are more likely, some are less likely. And if you think about the origin of life then as a sequence of chemical reactions, you're going to have some of which are more likely and some of which are less likely. And I think this chance versus necessity dichotomy really is misleading us into thinking 
in much too black and white terms, there's a more nuanced view. There are clearly going to be individual choke points, and maybe the real challenge for the origin of life then is to identify those one or very few reactions that are least likely, because that's the ones that are going to limit. So there's my conclusion. Chance versus necessity is inherently a false dichotomy when speaking about things like the origin of life. So finally, I want to demonstrate, and, and this is a, sort of a different aspect of this chance versus necessity thing. We tend to think as laboratory scientists of what we can do and go in and run experiments or make observations. I want to make it clear that Earth-like planets are quite different from a laboratory scale in terms of time and space. So chemical reactions that are very improbable in terms of reproducing them in the laboratory may be inevitable at planetary scales. And this is going to require doing a very simple back of the envelope calculation. How many chemical reactions can occur on an Earth-like planet? Now to do this calculation, I have to make another really gross assumption, and bear with me. The idea is that a origin of life experiment occurs on some interface or surface that has to do with molecules interacting with that surface, self-organizing or reacting on that surface. And we're trying to say how many times on, in the history of an Earth-like planet can this kind of thing happen? It's a very simplistic way of thinking about chemical reactions, but bear with me and then maybe we can have a more refined dialogue later. I need to answer four different questions to make this calculation. First is how long does it take for a reaction to occur on a mineral surface? How much surface area do you, do you need for one of those experiments in self-organization? And then at a planetary scale, how much time does Earth give us and how much surface area? And I'm going to be talking about mineral surface areas, but there are other surface areas we could add as well. So let's look at these four questions. How long does it take for a surface reaction to occur? And the answer is very extremely widely. If you've read any of the surface literature, you know this is true. Uh, you can have some surfaces where you have turnover rates of a thousand times a second very, very efficient catalysts that drive reactions. You can have other surfaces that once they're exposed to certain molecules are completely passivated for long periods of time. So reactions simply won't continue after that point. But I'm going to take just as a rough average estimate based on some of the things we've done, that maybe it's 10 seconds per experiment. Just go bear with me. And if you want to make it 100 times longer or 100 times shorter, then we can discuss that. But let's say this is the answer to our first question. The second question is rather easier. How much surface area does a mineral molecule interaction require? We're talking about molecules that are no more than a few nanometers in maximum dimension. We're talking about surfaces of minerals that have repeat distances of no more than a few nanometers. And so if you basically make a very conservative assumption that you need a 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer surface area, that gives us 10 to the minus 12th centimeters. That's the answer to question number two. Again, this may be off by a couple of orders magnitude either way, but you'll ultimately see that doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Now, what about Earth? How much time did Earth have to, for life to emerge? I loved Steve's talk. It gave us sort of a lower limit. Maybe it took just a few tens of millions of years after the moon forming impact, or maybe it was hundreds of millions of years. We know that there was life present at 3.5 billion because of stromatolites. We also have strong evidence that maybe as long as 4 billion years ago, there were some uh, organically processed carbon with isotopic signatures, and now we see in the zircons the similar kind of uh, very primitive isotopic signature. And so if you look at Earth, and let's just say 600 million years is the number. Again, give me an order of magnitude less than this, that's fine with the calculation, but I'm going to say 2 times 10 to the 16th seconds is the amount of time we have to play with. And finally, what is perhaps the most speculative and difficult calculation, how much surface area does Earth provide for us? Well, what we have to do is first look at Earth's total surface area, 5 times 10 to the 18th square centimeters, but of course that has nothing to do with the total mineral surface area because Earth's surface is covered with particulate soils, matters, things like sand grains, we have ash, we have volcanic particles at the nanoscale, huge amounts of surface area, and particularly we have clay minerals. And while there are many different kinds of clays and their properties vary, it's very typical that clays have a surface area of 2 times 10 to the 6 square centimeters per cubic centimeter of clay mineral. Now what does that mean? You've got a cubic centimeter of clay minerals, the surface area is that of a tennis court. So astonishing amounts of surface area on which chemical reactions might have occurred. Some surfaces are obviously going to be more reactive than others, more conducive, 
but this is just to give you a total surface area. Now, what's the average depth of clays on this early Earth? This is a really tough one. If you have a large, large amount of ocean, say it's 95% ocean, as Steve might have suggested, you still have a large amount of serpentinization, you have fracture and flow systems, you have water penetrating deep into that oceanic crust. If you have surface areas on land, you may be forming, again, some kind of, it wouldn't be a soil horizon, but a sediment horizon may be accumulating. And, and I don't know, I'm going to guess it's about a meter depth. And I'm going to say that it's predominantly clay minerals, so that's 100, meter, 100 centimeters thick or 100 cubic centimeters of clay minerals per square centimeter of earth surface. Today, of course, it's much, much greater than this. You can have many tens of meters of clays in deep soil horizons in various places, but we're talking about the Hidean Earth. So 100 cubic centimeters of clay for every square centimeter of the surface. You take the total surface area of Earth, you multiply it times 100 cubic centimeters. You know where I'm going with this, of course. That's a lot of clay minerals. That's half a million cubic kilometers of clay, clay minerals with a lot of surface area. And so you multiply it out. That's the tennis court for every one of those square centimeters of Earth's surface. Um, and you've got 10 to the 27th square centimeters of mineral surface area. Okay, th admittedly, this, I mean, this is amusing. It's a back of the envelope calculation, but I think it's what we can do. And now we multiply out these numbers, a very simple process. There's the surface area of Earth. There's the amount of time that we have to play with. And then you divide by the surface area and time for an individual experiment. There is the surface area and the time. And when you multiply this out, you can see it is a very large number. That's, that's my estimate for the number of experiments on an Earth-like planet prior to the origin of life. That's the number written out, two trillion, quadrillion, quadrillion, quadrillion chemical reactions. Okay, this may be off by much, many orders of magnitude. It doesn't really matter. The point is that most graduate students can't do that many experiments. <laughs> and, 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 and so Earth can do things in its time and spatial scales that we, small band of origin of life researchers, cannot easily do in our lifetimes. Now, obviously, there are things that we can do to alleviate this disparity. But my first point is that things that are improbable at the short time scale and limited spatial scale of laboratories may be inevitable at planetary scales. Now, we can use chemical and physical intuition. Obviously, we can eliminate many kinds of chemical reactions. We can work backwards from today's biology and limit the kinds of chemical pathways we're looking for. <laughs> there are all sorts of new approaches that I don't think have been effectively applied yet to origins of life that involve combinatorial chemistry and also computational chemistry that allow us to sample many more uh, abilities. And of course, we need to hire more students. And, and I, I've, I've got to give credit. I've, these are some of the people I've worked with in this field. And I am so thrilled to, to be able to be associated with many early career scientists who have really pushed the frontiers. Teresa's here. Hi, Teresa. And, uh, and, and it's really been great. But that's, that's sort of a, uh, our game plan. But we need to recognize this in the back of our minds that planets are very large and they're very old. OK, so life's origin can be framed as a sequence of chemical reactions. When you do this, you need to recognize the chance versus necessity to put that as your mindset, as a false dichotomy. Think in a more global sense of probabilities of things happening. Finally, chemical reactions that are improbable at the scale of the lab may be inevitable at the scale of the planets. And finally, when you think about scale of planets, remember you have to multiply planet Earth by maybe 10 to the 20th when you look at the cosmos. And so there are all those additional orders of magnitudes. So is life a cosmic imperative? I, I mean, I'd love to see a vote. You wouldn't be here probably if you didn't think so. So let's, how many people think right now life is a cosmic imperative? And how many think it's like a unique event in the, well, okay, so, but we don't know, right? So, so I want to thank my, um, my funding agencies and, and thank all of you for your attention and putting up with this. <laughs>